everyone, I'm Anastasia Zadai Kipkins. I'm the producer of tonight's show and Associate We All board member. On behalf of everyone involved, I wanna thank you for tuning in tonight for this hybrid version of VAMP. We're so happy to be here at the Whistle Stop filming in front of a very small, but very live audience. And we are looking forward to everything opening up someday so we can all be together again. Like many people, I was introduced to So Say We All as an audience member. Standing in the back of the bar, it was really crowded. I was barely able to see over people's heads and I remember thinking I could never stand up here and tell a story. But then six years ago, exactly, in May of 2015, I wrote a story and it was accepted. And a bunch of incredibly generous people here at BAMP, including Eber Lampert, who was my first writing coach, and Jennifer Corley, I'm not supposed to point, but she's over there, um, <laughs> who was my performance coach, and the group of writers that I was working with, they all helped me to learn to tell my story better. Since then, I've performed in several vamps. I've been a writing coach and a performance coach and a producer and a board member. And every time I tell a story, or every time I work with someone who's about to tell their story, I'm reminded of the words of my first vamp producer, Neil McDevitt, who said back in 2015, everyone here wants you to be successful. We're all rooting for you. And he was absolutely right. So here how, here's how BAMP works. You write a story and you submit it through via submittable. And there's a link on our website, so say we all online.com. And the story goes through a blind jury evaluation. And if it's chosen, then you take part in a group critique session with the other writers in your show so that you can all learn from each other and support each other. Then you work with a writing coach and a performance coach, and then you read it at our show, which soon, we hope, <laughs> will be in front of a live audience of people that really, truly want you to succeed. Honestly, you can trust me on that, <laughs> which I acknowledge is the opposite message of tonight's theme, bamboozle. <laughs> And without further ado, I'm now pleased to announce the lineup and bring up our first reader. Our performers tonight are, give it up for, Kelly Bowen, <laughs> Ben Kent, Elaine Gingery, Bianca Sanchez, Brent Hanafy, and leading us off, Leslie Ferguson. At first, I was thrilled by my divorce. <laughs> to be unattached, unanchored, independent. Then, one Sunday, the grief arrived, and I geared up for the big cry. Finally, I was ready for a good cleansing, you know? The ugliest crying I could imagine, and snot, tears, and pathetic howls from the belly of my heart. This kind of ritual was expected. I'd wasted the better part of my 20s with the wrong guy. <laughs> I grabbed a box of Kleenex and sat on the bed, the same bed that hadn't seen any action in over a year, the same bed that now seemed too big for one person. I had cozy blankets, a body pillow, <laughs> and an entire forlorn afternoon to myself. I pulled a few tissues from the box, and took a long, slow, shaky breath. But all that escaped my throat was a single, choked sob. Is that it? <laughs> I waited. My heart palpitated like a twittering animal. Yep, that was it. <laughs> I'd failed at marriage, and now I'd failed at crying, too. <laughs> Maybe I'd cried so much during the relationship, I had no more tears to give. One day, at Starbucks, I graded essays about the significance of Jay Gatsby's abundance of beautiful shirts. I looked up to see this guy enjoying his hot grande whatever and staring at me. I gave him a quick smile, intending to politely acknowledge his existence rather than open a door for him to walk through. Taking the wrong cue, he sauntered over, <laughs> wearing transition lenses, new balance walking shoes, and a wrinkled polo shirt tucked into belted, high-waisted dad jeans. He introduced himself, Elijah. I told him my name, and he proceeded to ask questions, 
What do you teach? Where do you live? I don't see a ring. Does that mean you're single? Will you go out with me? That escalated quickly. I told him I was just getting out of a relationship. This was technically true, but also a lie. I had never let a breakup stop me in the past. Once the guy was gone, I chose a shiny new one to take his place. So either I coped well with loss, or I had the attention span of a toddler. How do you know you're not interested? You haven't been on a date with me yet, Elijah sipped his drink. Because it's not you, it's me. Sorry, I'm just not interested. This was also the truth, and a lie. I was always interested in dating. I could have been interested in Elijah if he had cooler clothes and, frankly, a better face. (laughs) I was ready to move on from my divorce, but I couldn't come out of the gates dating someone who wore New Balance. (laughs) Then he asked if I was a Christian. I should have said, forget it, it is you. Instead, I explained that I was more spiritual than religious. When Elijah started to defend the Lord, it was a sign I needed to gather my belongings and get the hell out of there. I shook his hand. He held on. Don't make me beg, he said. One date. I wanted him to beg. I wanted him to say I was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen, and that he'd never forgive himself if he just let me walk away. I loved that someone was talking to me, just not that he was talking to me. (laughs) Come on, one date. I suppose it was unreasonable to think he should get on his knees or climb onto the table and serenade me. So, feeling like a satisfied attention whore, I said yes. Can I borrow a pen? He said, feeling his chest pocket. I suggested he put my number in his phone. He said he didn't have one. Oh man, I regretted this already. (laughs) He knew I had a pen, so I pulled one from my bag. I still didn't really want to go out with him, but honestly, I could have used more flattery in my life. Besides, I had been quick to judge in the past, Good looks and style outweighed more important qualities like honesty and a personality. If beauty was only skin deep, maybe ugly was too. This date was an opportunity to prove to myself I could look beyond the shoes, the receding hairline, the god, (laughs) and choose a man for his strengths rather than reduce him to the weaknesses I perceived. On Saturday night, I arrived at the Summit House for some fine dining. Elijah wore a black polo, basic dad jeans, and the same geriatric footwear he wore the day I said yes. Over our pricey prime rib dinners, Elijah explained his current employment status. Well, I'm student teaching, so my eyes glazed over. Having been a student teacher myself, I knew prime rib was probably out of his budget and I have Bible study most evenings, he said. Believing in Jesus has changed my life. "Mm Mm-hmm, I nodded, then drained my wine glass. Where was our waiter? Elijah scored a point by insisting on paying the bill. Eager to cut the night short, I thanked him, and he walked me to my car. He grew closer to me, putting his hands on my waist. I patted his shoulder, a move I thought would send him straight to the friend zone. But he swooped in and kissed me. This was unexpected. How could a Jesus freak be such a mind-blowingly good kisser? (laughs) I agreed to a second date almost immediately. When he pulled back, I smiled and began mentally scripting our future. On our second date, Elijah talked exclusively about the Bible. I barely listened, holding out for the fun part, a makeout session in my car. God, I missed being kissed. I couldn't believe it. Did Elijah and I stand a real chance? I want to take you to church with me one Sunday, he said. Now, I wasn't big on Jesus, but I was huge on being wanted. 
So I agreed to go. Elijah planted one more kiss on my mouth before leaving. I watched him walk away in the dark. I hated those dad jeans. Don't be shallow, clothes don't matter. <sighs> on the drive home, my mind ping-ponged. Was I desperate? What if I actually did need Jesus in my life? <laughs> did my divorce fuck me up so much that I would willingly trash my core beliefs to experience passion again? And how soon should I start practicing the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> Elijah invited me out for tacos, a considerable step down from prime rib. <laughs> Disappointed by the restaurant's chipped formica tables and lack of air conditioning, I fanned myself as sweat dripped between my boobs. I dabbed my face and my neck with my napkin. Despite Elijah's faith and my lack of one, despite my actual income and his lack of one, I still wanted him to kiss me. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we sat in his truck which had about 100 miles to go before it would cost more to fix than it was worth. He punched the radio on, and I don't remember the song that spewed out because when he didn't lean in to kiss me, I asked him what was wrong. Staring straight ahead, he said, in the Bible, there was a cautionary tale about Jezebel's manipulating good Christian men and <laughs> causing them to veer off course. I should have seen that one coming a mile away. But instead of telling him to fuck off, the only thing my mouth did was quiver. Here it was, the big cry. <laughs> it wouldn't come out months ago, but here it was. I'm on a path, he said, and I can't let anything derail me. I wasn't interested in Elijah's path, yet I cried because I wasn't on it. This was not what I expected, especially since I thought I was the catch in the scenario. One thing I know about my tears, they prefer to show up at the worst time. I was so mad at myself for crying in the first place, I cried more. Then it occurred to me that Elijah might think I was crying over him, which also made me cry more. <laughs> I'd never even read the story of Jezebel, so how could he blame me for being like her? Wasn't I beautiful? Wasn't I worthy? Didn't I wear better shoes than he did? <laughs> or was I just a fool ignoring her instincts? I'd been here before, questioning my own standards and worth. I just never thought I'd be back here so soon, dumped by some guy in the ripped cab seat of a beat-up truck outside a shitty taco place in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I wiped my eyes and pathetically offered Elijah a goodbye hug. He didn't think a hug was such a good idea. Perhaps he feared my almighty breasts pressed against his torso would compel him straight to hell. As I walked to my car, I looked back in case Elijah had changed his mind. But his jalopy had already left the lot. On the drive home, I blasted the radio and sobbed stupidly, wiping my eyes every time the road blurred. I got home changed into my pajamas, and went into the bathroom. My eyes were red, mascara streaked, skin blotchy. If I was a Jezebel, I was a hollowed out mess of one. But I had to admit, a nice long cry looked pretty damn good on me. <laughs> product of a self-improvement seminar junkie. That's how I describe my mom's free fall from one new age jargon-laden process to another in her quest to conquer the demons wrought by her own overbearing mother. My childhood memories are filled with bits espoused from whatever program she'd just skated through. She would light up with animated passion describing what she'd learned and how amazing it was Mostly, I wanted to know what was for dinner. <laughs> My mom always told me she wanted to break the familial patterns, to not bully me as she'd been bullied by her mother. She chased that goal through countless enlightenment programs. 
She did gestalt group therapy, engaged in rebirthing to expunge the traumas of her own birth, <laughs> took multiple trips to the Esalen Institute in Big Sur for workshops, nearly finished training to become a facilitator of a program dryly called Money and You that was really nothing about money, <laughs> and there was the Personal Transformation and Self-Awareness program founded by Werner Earhart, Earhart Seminars Training, or EST as it's commonly referred to, with its modus operandi of deconstruction through confrontation. <laughs> I had just turned 11 when my mom got it, as they used to say in the EST world. She dove into her latest love affair with reckless abandon, lauding her newly acquired self-awareness over everyone around her, including me, a wee sixth grader. I watched in repressed horror as first my father, despite having long been divorced from my mother, fell to her pressure and took the training. Then our parents sent my 13-year-old brother, Mike. He did not come home beaming. <laughs> my mom continued taking the weekly seminars that were du rigueur of est. At the end of the two weekend long training, instead of being able to walk into the world a whole new capable person, she signed up for another seminar. With each one, she became more self-righteous. She began a litany of wanting me to take the training. My life was incomplete, she decried, without going through the seminar. All I wanted was to be loved and allowed to be a kid, to play with my stuffed animals and giggle watching cartoons. Est in the way my mom barked incomprehensible catchphrases scared me. But as an adoptee with abandonment issues, my fears of being discarded had been honed to a fine perfection under her self-focused rearing. I never spoke my truth. But I had been paying attention. The training was for adults, though kids sometimes took part. To bridge that gap, they made a per young person's training for ages 6 to 12. But these were seldom held. It had been years since they'd done one anywhere on the West Coast. I rationalized I could placate my mom's incessant demand for me to want to go to Est with something that wouldn't happen. I was so smug, as I told her, I would go only if there's a young person's training. I almost escaped. <laughs> then my mom came to me beaming with glee. Kelly! They scheduled a young person's training in LA just three weeks before your 13th birthday. Great. I'd finish the training and age out just days after its conclusion. Despite my efforts to conceal my terror, it must have transmitted on my face. I didn't say anything, but her next words were, you promised if there's a young person's training, you promised you would go. Oh, how I wish I could sit on the shoulder of my youthful self and whisper, look at your power, as if she's a kid pouting because you don't want to play with her. Just tell her no. You changed your mind. Or better yet, you never wanted to go in the first place. But at the time, I didn't think I had a choice. To fight her was to risk her love, so I went. Early in the morning on the first Saturday, I stood in line in the antiseptic hotel hallway outside the conference room, surrounded by roughly 100 other miserable-looking children. <laughs> Our parents talked to the people behind the check-in desks. We were given name tags and told to wear them, and then our parents stepped away, leaving us in the hands of the EST staff. We were led into the conference room, which had been set up in several slightly arched rows of chairs with an aisle down the middle. A stage faced the chairs, not a particularly tall one, just tall enough to establish dominance. There was a plush chair on the stage resembling that of something found in a smoking room. It bespoke elegance, superiority, and a disengaged disdain. <laughs> Our chairs were narrow and designed for stacking in corners when they weren't packing people into too little personal space. While they were not linked, they were uncomfortably close together. The chairs looked plush, but like the smiles from the trainer, they were hard and unyielding. As they led us to our seats, we received the first of our instructions for the training. No talking, walk single file. 
The rest of the instructions were similarly austere. There would be two bathroom breaks and a lunch break. We were not allowed to use the bathroom outside of the breaks. We were not allowed food or water outside of lunch. We were not to talk unless invited to do so, even on the bathroom breaks. Those were conducted walking a single file to the appropriate restroom where we were to efficiently use the facilities and return to the line to be led back to the seminar. The trainer, a severe looking woman, loomed over us. <laughs> Punctuating her lectures, children were asked to share about what they were experiencing and the feelings being evoked. This meant getting on the stage and telling a personal story while the trainer interrupted, often with yelling, until the child broke down, frequently shedding tears. After, the trainer would applaud this as personal growth, smiling in a way that did not reach her eyes. I sat as rigidly as possible. There was no way I was sharing. On the second day, there was a little boy seated in the row ahead of me. He must have been bored. I know I was. But he was only six and unable to see the ramifications of disobedience. Compared to me at nearly 13, trying to melt into the carpet. He turned around in his seat to look at me and several other kids. He didn't smile or make faces. That much awareness of his situation filtered into his brain. But his youthful energy couldn't keep him seated properly. The trainer barked, you, turn around and sit facing forward. Yes, you. A look of shame flashed over his face as he turned back and sat. The trainer went on. He got bored again. Again, he turned in his chair. His feet hung over the edge of the seat, kicking slightly with repressed energy. Again, the trainer barked at him. After the third such occurrence, she changed her tactic. She loudly declared, if you refuse to sit the way you are meant to, you will sit here. She pointed to the stage. Bring your chair. The small boy lumbered with the chair, looking like a dog expecting to be kicked. He struggled with it. No one helped him. No one would have dared as it was clear it wasn't allowed. He placed the chair on the stage where instructed, now sit backwards. That little boy spent hours sitting facing us from the stage, stiffly perched with his hands gripping the chair back, pinned in place by fear, but looking desperate with the desire to move. I don't remember any of the training material, but I will never forget the look on that boy's face. I writhed inside with discomfort for him. That night, my mom asked how it was. It was great, I lied. There was no way I was expressing how much I hated it because she would have confronted me and I just spent 10 hours skirting confrontation from the trainer. The training was two weekends long. During the intervening week, I got sick, really sick, 102 degree fever, body aches, horrible congestion. As the second weekend of my training loomed, I was still abed too sick to go to school my mom disregarded that I was ill. She said, oh, get off it. You're not going, getting out of your training. The morning of that first day of the second weekend, I could barely sit up in a chair. I didn't know how I would make it through the day. I tried to eat oatmeal in the hotel restaurant. It was a pasty, flavorless glob in my bowl. Each bite made me queasy. For decades afterwards, I couldn't eat oatmeal. The second weekend was much the same as the first, though the little boy sat facing forward. Who would want to risk that twice? Finally, we reached the end. There was cheering and applause for how we'd all gotten it. I never did figure out what it was. <laughs> My mom was ecstatic. I was just glad it was done. But then came the inevitable browbeating from her of, what seminar are you going to take next? My brother and I colluded. We picked the one they recommended first, charmingly called Be Here Now. We decided to go together to lessen our pain. We were allowed to miss one week while we went to a summer camp. At camp, we were surrounded by happy kids and adults, encouraged to excel, told over and over about what things we could achieve if we put our minds to it. It was the antithesis of Est. Where Est was deconstruction, the camp was bolstering. 
Est was belligerent. Camp was laughter and smiles. We came home completely over Est, but we had two sessions left in our seminar. We'd muddle through and then be done. About halfway through the last night of the seminar, cards and pencils were passed out. We were told to write our name and what seminar we were going to sign up for next. My brother and I looked at each other from across the room. His face bolstered my confidence. I wrote only my name. I passed my card and pencil towards the center aisle. The facilitator kept talking. Several minutes passed. Then from the back of the room, a name was called. A man stood from his seat and dutifully walked to the back as directed. I didn't know what that was about. More names were called. More people went to the back. Finally, my name was called. I stood dread in my stomach, but fueled with conviction. I walked to the back where a man said, I see here you didn't put down a seminar. I'm not going to take another one. But what seminar are you going to take? He replied. <laughs> I repeated myself. Was he daft? Why are you resisting? What seminar are you going to take? Fear riveted me in place. I was just past 13. I barely even needed a bra, and this man who must have been in his late 40s towered over me, demanding I stopped resisting. Finally, I blurted out the name of some seminar they'd mentioned. He gleefully noted it on my card. At long last, I was allowed to return to my seat. My brother had the same experience. But when we got home, we told our father we were not going to another EST seminar. We'd only given them the name of one to escape. Thankfully, our father supported our decision. He even told our mom. In hindsight, her lack of argument indicated a power I didn't know I possessed, that my mom feared my rejecting her as much as I feared her abandoning me. It wasn't long before she moved on to whatever program she found after EST. For years, the EST folks called. My dad's a funny guy. He'd shout, Kelly, you have a phone call. As soon as my greeting was answered with a cajoling, what seminar are you going to take? He'd allow his withheld laughter to burst forth. They finally stopped calling. It was probably only because I'd gone to college and had a new number. My mom tried to do her best, but was her own form of domineering draped in the mantle of caring. If I'm honest, the aftermath of her and her obsession with trying to mold me to reflect her all shaped me into who I am today, self-reflective and willing to look at my foibles in order to grow and evolve. I may not have ever gotten it, but now I get me. Abandonment is no longer the driving force behind my decisions. Being true to myself is. I'm not resisting, but no, mom, I'm not signing up for another seminar. Thank you. Alex's hands always shake. He told you once how it started, but you can't quite remember now. Was it a hard hit back in Nebraska? You know something made him quit football because he went to the academy for wrestling instead. What you do remember is that one time in Quantico when Amazon fucked up his supplement delivery. <laughs> you watched him open the stained, unmarked package with trembling fingers, and you cracked up when the mail corporal ducked and covered, bracing for a bomb. You both still laugh about that. His hands still waver a little now as he pinches off a lip of Copenhagen. You're counting radios, baking dull green in the Kuwaiti sun, checking serial numbers. It's a short list. Everything else he'd written off as a combat loss, signed in his lazy, scrawled signature. The rest of them are all green dust now, he says, smashed to bits in the Anbar Desert to keep them out of the militia's hands. We broke so many radios, he says, the sledgehammer fell from his fingers the last day. You roll your eyes at the mountain of bureaucratic red tape that follows the emergency evacuation of a forward operating base in a hostile environment. It's the second one, this deployment. 
You mentioned that's probably not good geopolitically. <laughs> you see Alex thrust a fist in his pocket as he spits out his contempt for the command element that pulled his security away early, leaving his guys exposed and surrounded. He laughs, joking that the Shia militias in Anbar were just too damn tired to come over the wire anymore, no matter what Tehran shook their fist about. He plays with his tin of cope as you bring up the night spent on high alert. His cowboy drawl becomes a taut wire. He wipes a hand across his mustache, scruffy and out of rags. The hand shakes. High alert. That's what CNN called it, at least for the few days it mattered in the news cycle. To you, high alert is a shitty Kuwaiti ringtone at midnight. <laughs> it's PJ telling you to listen closely, and you try to shake off the sleep to process Iranian and imminent. It sounds like you rustling in the dark for your flak and Kevlar. It's Jack and Tom in the hall in shorts and hoodies, and it's, wait, for real? <laughs> then it's the rip of Velcro and heavy footsteps on linoleum. It's the eerie quiet of the desert night as you walk the same path you take every morning to get to work. To you, high alert looks like a herd of marines squeezing into a crumbling concrete shell. It's a shape emerging from the darkness with a rifle. It's your corporal on watch, thought to grab a weapon. Good marine instinct. Totally useless here. <laughs> it looks like your platoon sergeant walking back and forth getting a head count. He's pushing the platoon broke dick, limping, his gear tumbling unassembled off his frame, into the press of bodies in the bunker. It's you, PJ, the boss, and two NCOs outside because there's not enough space for everyone. The boss asks you which way is northeast, so you point and turn and stare and wait for... what? A flash? A whine? A drone? A shooting star? What vehicle, what platform, what asset? You don't know enough about Iranian munitions, so you just watch the stars. It's an empty sky until you hear the words all clear, crackle and boom over the big voice system. It's the platoon crawling out from the bunker, circling up. It's the same empty streets on the way back to your bed that you'll lay in, but not sleep. Side effects of high alert include a lump in your stomach that each day finds a new depth to descend to. It may cause an itching sensation as your flak digs into your shoulders while you wear your body armor between the gym, mess hall, and the office, since you didn't think you'd need the padded shoulder straps on this deployment. <laughs> you experience a moment of alienation as you pass Air Force guys in the street. They on their way to just another Tuesday, and your Marines kitted up like they're about to patrol. You each wonder who's the crazy ones. Who knows something the other doesn't? The, the exchange is wordless stares. Didn't you hear there's a war almost on? Yeah, but didn't you know we're not a strategic target? <laughs> but we're in the weapons engagement zone. But if it escalates that high, your flax and helmets won't save you anyway. <laughs> All week you have caffeine jitters without a drop of coffee. You don't need it, your heart rate is already elevated. It'll mess up what little sleep you get. You wake up alert to crawl in a sandbag bunker for another hour with PJ, Jack, and Tom. Slump shadows and combat gear, boxers and crocs, waiting for the big voice to release you to your bunk again. Three hours later, you'll wake up alert again to go to the gym and eat breakfast as if you'd blinked, not slept. The cognitive dissonance grows. You explain to staff NCOs, mentally calcified on the war on terror status quo, that Iranian indirect fire does not mean shitty Katushka rockets lobbed from Farmer Ahmed's truck. <laughs> you brief smart young sergeants on the emergency course of action. It doesn't involve our weapons. It doesn't involve taking the fight to the enemy. Quantico taught you to brief Marines in harm's way. Quantico did not teach you how to tell them to forgo the tools and tactics that become cultural touchstones. They'll do it. They don't like it. You talk with PJ and the boss. You decide who shelters where, who sprints to the flight line, and who stays put. The boss will stay put. That lump finds a new depth. If anyone should ask for a definition, you decide high alert is the contradictory, absurd thrill of finally being involved with something more than just the daily grind, paired with the timeless military sigh of, fuck this bullshit. <laughs> because escalating a proxy war profoundly screws up your personal gym, work, Hulu, sleep routine. <laughs> high alert killed the salads, the fruit and chicken. You've been doing a decent job of eating. It's, it's burgers and fries this week, because fuck it, you don't care about taste, just calories. High alert isn't combat. 
you still have ice cream at the chow hall. You still have to get a haircut. You still have the gym. You still have emails to, from home to reply to, lying by omission. You have your normal job, but now you also have the lump and your flack and go bag and radio and the bunker layout and Excel sheet and your flyaway team roster memorized. Here's what high alert sounds like the morning after. It's the rush call to Alex up north, who sat in his operations center last night as the impact warning became a countdown and someone starts to cry on the watch floor. Embracing the absurdity of having nothing else to do, he packs a lip and goes outside to watch the rockets streak overhead. If one rocket were to cut short its arc through the desert sky and fall on his head, he wonders, how long until word gets to Jenny? She's buried without internet access in her cruiser's engine room, running dark somewhere in the Indian Ocean. He tugs his Teflon wedding, wedding band. The rockets keep going. The question is moot. Their impact is someone else's problem now. You both pause in the line and listen to static for a moment. Alex reluctantly admits it was a smart geopolitical move. And you wonder if a downed civilian airliner outside of Tehran just bought you all a day of breathing room. The same questions echo in every office as you wait a full work day for it to be morning in DC. Hurried verbal rehearsals give way to long silence, punctuated with any random conversation starter that comes to mind. You share Wikipedia fun facts as you scroll through pages about the Islamic Republic and plunge down a rabbit hole ending with the Achaemenid dynasty. <laughs> High alert is the hum of conversation from the bodies squeezed together on the office couch. It's the pundits in the background as you wait for the speech from the White House. It's the communal shiver as you all laugh your asses off. You laugh at the blonde Fox reporters and the brunette MSNBC ones. You laugh at the poor, ugly BBC think tank nerd and the poor presidential aide who has to change the speech on the podium twice. You laugh at WWE because it's on while we wait and fuck it, why not? You're dead silent as the president speaks. You get up off the couch, you go to dinner. Normalcy rushes in like the tide. Six months and a quarantine later, it's your third time on a surfboard in the California sun. It's Alex's second, and he's better than you. You don't care. You just love being in the water now like you never did before. You don't miss the bars you thought you'd go to, and you didn't prepay for that Bronco, after all. You ask about the internship he landed, and he scratches the new clipper ship inked on his chest as he shrugs and wonders if it's the right fit or just a stepping stone. He points out to a set coming in slow, emerald, inevitably cold. His hand wavers a little. You wonder if it's the chill in the air or something else. After all, Alex's hands always shake. Yeah! Thank you. When I was growing up, all the kids in our neighborhood had penises. <laughs> and if I wanted to have friends to play with, I had to spend a fair amount of time hoping they wouldn't notice that I didn't. Don't get me wrong. I, I didn't want to be a boy, but I didn't really want them to think too hard about the fact that I wasn't one of them. My mom let me be most of the time, but lectures about appropriate dress and an expectation that I can form made their appearance around holidays and of course, regarding church. I protested loudly and physically when a dress was required on Sundays or for a family function, insisting that the ruffles itched or the skirt made it impossible for me to climb. And seriously, why do you have to get in trouble when you scuff up these stupid shiny shoes? <laughs> the minute I got home, I ditched the dress, kick off my shoes, find a way to fit back into my skin. Sometimes I let G lit GI Joes on fire with a can of WD-40 and a match. But more often, I would climb to the top of a tree, enjoying the added bonus that I'd be hard to find. The boys, however, started to other me around middle school when breasts made their unwelcome appearance on my chest, two little buds that declared I was no dude. I was in my room getting changed after a day with the boys, playing bomb shelter in the soft dirt under the porch, when I heard an odd noise at my door. I turned to see my friends, the boys who weren't supposed to think of me as a girl looking in at me through a crack. Their eyes were focused on my body in a way that made my face flush red as I crossed my arms over my chest, turning away and grabbing a shirt to tug over my head. The tears carved a path down my dirt-streaked face and showed me for what I was, a girl, and a sensitive one at that. 
The more my body developed, the more I realized that my days as just one of the guys, those were over. I started to spend more time with the girls at school and turn less and less often to the boys on the block, acutely aware of the new eyes they saw me through. In high school, I developed a friend group that was mixed with girls who got me and guys who felt familiar and safe. Learning how to have male friends while sporting a curvy body and a raging case of teen hormones was a process. <laughs> but some of those guys are still close friends today, so I figured it out. In college, I gravitated towards a women's studies department and picked up a minor in the field, learning all the ways that society demands women be more and less at the same time. I met a guy who loved me for who I was and didn't care if I wore makeup or skirts and knew I was never going to le learn how to walk in high heels. <laughs> When we got married, he changed his name to mine, both of us wearing a surname that fit our family best. I kicked ass at feminism and had made peace with being a girl, just I did it on my own terms. It wasn't until I got pregnant that my identity and feminist training started to feel overly complicated. Up until that point, I hadn't felt very traditionally feminine, but pregnancy, it dropped me into this heart space of womanhood. I embodied the goddess with my full round tummy, ever expanding hips, and voluptuous breasts. <laughs> I never felt more beautiful and powerful. For the first time in my life, every part of this body had a job. <laughs> and growing this baby felt like something I'd been made to do. Despite my newfound peace with my own body, I did not want to have a girl. I wanted a child who could run and play and get dirty without having to do battle for the world and her rightful place in it. Having a boy would solve that, I thought. Yeah. As my friends had babies and found out the sex of their child via sonogram, I'd seen what happened to their baby showers, an aggressive gendering that no infant should have to endure. Their baby showers would be pink or blue bonanzas, a riot of gender-specific toys and clothing. It felt like there was no chance for a kid to just be a kid. They had to be a boy or a girl, and this carried so many rules and limitations. I just didn't want a child of mine to start off like that. So we refused to find out the sex of the baby before the birth. Every time someone would ask us what we were having, I'd rub my hand across my round belly and say, well, we're hoping for puppies, but a baby <laughs> might be nice. At our shower, we were gifted a lot of green and yellow baby clothes and animal-themed toys. I took this as a sign. I really was kicking ass at feminism. <laughs> Despite the lack of a sonogram, however, I had somehow become convinced that we were having a boy. My labor was intense and fast, so when my husband announced, it's a girl, mere hours after my first contraction, I remember thinking he must have gotten it wrong. I waited for him to look away and then surreptitiously checked his math. No balls, no penis, this infant was definitely a girl. I lay there at the birth center, wide awake, high on adrenaline, my body empty and sore, while my husband and daughter slept peacefully next to me. What the hell had, had just happened? Not only had I given birth, which seemed entirely impossible, but to a girl child? One who might like princesses and dresses and, God forbid, Barbie dolls. <laughs> not on my watch, my hormone-flooded brain insisted. I would not allow my daughter to be grossly gendered and forced into the world of girly things. I want her to be able to be whoever she is, without the demands of society telling her what she has to like. Regardless, I waited for the onslaught of pink when we announced her birth, and let me tell you, the onslaught, it arrived. <laughs> I counterattacked with trucks, tools, and books. I dressed her in whatever I wanted, shunning as much of the pink as I could. If someone accidentally called her a little boy, I felt like maybe I was doing this right. <laughs> I could totally rear up this kid without the onus of girl ruining her, even though there were no boys on the block for her to play with, and our playgroup was over 80% girls. I kept the house Barbie-free and steered her away from anything pink because feminism, damn it! <laughs> If you are calling me an idiot, you are not wrong. <laughs> Cut forward a couple years. We had another baby, this one also a girl. <laughs> We're on an extended vacation in Mexico, visiting family at their bed and breakfast in La Paz, Baja. We are celebrating our niece's birthday in the main palapa at Casa Buena. My daughters have raided their cousin's dress up box and are in the most ridiculous, ridiculous dresses you have ever seen. Neither are complaining of itchy ruffles nor an inability to climb. In Mexico, see, little girls are princesses, and trying to explain that you want your children to grow up feminists get you nothing but raised eyebrows and a cluck of the tongue. Besides, you should have seen the way my daughter's faces lit up when they put on those damn dresses. 
The look of pure ecstasy when they first twirled around, synthetic fabric ruffling dramatically. Fuck it, I thought, mentally waving my hand. It's vacation. My niece unwrapped yet another Barbie doll. Something I had never allowed my girls to play with, much less own. I rolled my eyes. My eldest at three and a half quietly disappeared from the party. I knew she couldn't go far in the enclosed walls of the bed and breakfast compound, and so was mostly unconcerned. But after a while, I sent my husband to search for her anyway. He spotted her at the top of a spiral staircase up near our room, and when their eyes met, she ran backwards away. What you doing? He asked, his voice gentle as he wound his way up the stairs. Nothing, she yelled, her <laughs> eyes wide and urgent. Go back down there! <laughs> Three-year-olds, they make terrible covert operatives. <laughs> As he walked into our room, she wildly flung something under her bed, but he kept his eyes on her, crouching down and looking her dead in the face, just waiting for her to break. She instantly dissolved and pointed under the bed, giving herself up. He extracted the brand new Barbie, and she fell apart, explaining that it was just so pretty, and she just wanted it so much. <laughs> After my husband told me the story, we laughed about it. Her desperation and thievery so out of character for her. We made her return the doll and apologize to her cousin, who hadn't really noticed it was missing, what with the entire sorority house of Barbie she had received. <laughs> My children continued gorging on pink and girly things through the rest of the trip, Mexico and a well-stocked cousin, allowing them to embrace the pink tide I had so carefully kept from them as they grew. I kept telling myself that this too shall pass. It's no big deal. But a tiny curl of doubt had planted itself in my belly. We went back to the States back to a home void of Barbies and fluffy pink dresses. My daughters resumed playing with the toys available, but somehow I only then noticed how they played with them. They cradled their trucks, rocking them to sleep, <laughs> and found ways to feminize the clothes I had so carefully bought to be gender neutral. Something deep within me tugged, a small thought that bloomed carefully that maybe denying this part of themselves doesn't honor any of us. Not long after we're back, we visited one of my favorite secondhand shops. Just my big kid with me while the little one napped at home with her dad. I'd gotten to know the owner fairly well, and she showed me a shipment she just got in. A box full of Scarlett O'Hara style gowns for little girls. My daughter's eyes rolled back in her head with joy, and I found myself restless with conflict. The shop owner scooped up the fluffiest, pinkest one in the box and squatted down next to my daughter with it. This one is perfect for you. Oh, we couldn't, I, I protested as my daughter fell on it like a hungry cougar. <laughs> it's my gift to you, she said. It's obvious how much she loves it. And she, and she was right. <laughs> my daughter was tugging the dress over her jeans and non-gender tee like her life depended on it. I watched as my friend helped her into the dress and led her over to a mirror, a look on my daughter's face I had never seen before. My face flushed red as I crossed my arms over my chest, hugging myself while an old familiar sense of shame flooded through me. Had I been wrong? Am I actually a bad feminist? <laughs> the small bloom of a thought pushed upward, breaking the surface and tearing a hole in my carefully constructed reality. Have I been doing this all wrong? When did I decide that feminism meant not female? Or a complete lack of girly things? Have I forgotten to allow my children the basic right to be who they are? I turned away from my prancing pink meringue of a child and <laughs> tears pricking my eyes and stepped away into the corner. The wall there was busy with plastic bags full of smaller toys hanging on hooks for display. One of them caught my eye and I stepped closer. Inside, an orgy of naked Barbies, arms and legs akimbo, faces frozen and perfectly made up smiles. I took the bag off the wall, find another one behind it with assorted clothing inside. My free hand scrubbed my face with the emotion still tugging at me, and I turned around, stalking over to the counter. Can you ring me up for these? I asked, placing the jumble of Barbies down while I fumbled for my wallet. My tiny southern bell of a child sidled up to me, still encased in the dress, one hand reaching up to fit itself into mine, while her other hand traveled to her mouth, thumb fitting into place as she contentedly leaned against me. Once home, she and her sister played with Barbies as though it were their only job. <laughs> Spending probably two weeks engrossed in nothing else. And just when I started to think that this would be my life now, a life of pretty, soft-spoken, girly girls who only wear pink and drink tea, a life that I have no basis for understanding, I noticed that the Barbies become like every other toy a child has. 
just a part of the mess on the floor. The Barbies now ride the trucks to work. <laughs> and their clothes often end up wrapped around a favorite stick. <laughs> the dresses and dolls have woven their way into the fabric of their play rather than being the star of it. They are both things, my beautiful daughters, girly and fearless, sweet little monsters in jeans and tees, climbing and caring and being fully who they are. As a teenager, my mom used to tell me, good things come to those who wait. At the age of 19, I did not believe this to be true. Up to that point, I had never had a boyfriend, nor had I even gone on a first date. Every guy I had a crush on always seemed interested in someone else. Someone prettier, someone smarter, someone who wasn't me. In my melodramatic mind, I believed I wasn't worthy of love and was destined to be alone. The year I turned 20, my luck changed. I was asked out on my first date. I remember the day. It was a Saturday, and I'd just woken up. I usually spent Saturday mornings lying in bed, scrolling through Facebook. What's the rush when every day's the same? I was still living with my parents. I still slept under the Barbie comforter it had since I was six. And I still had the same shirtless Taylor Lautner poster on my wall from when I was 13. <laughs> But something did change that day. When I opened my Facebook app, I had a new message. It was from Jose, a boy I went to high school with. The message said, hey, what's up? According to the timestamp, it was sent at 4 AM. <laughs> I didn't respond. It wasn't that I didn't want to talk to him. I just didn't understand why he wanted to talk to me. I'd had several classes with Jose in high school, and he never spoke to me. I didn't think he knew I existed. So I couldn't help wondering, why was he contacting me two years after graduation? I ignored the message. The next day, as I was getting ready for bed, Jose messaged me again, how are you? With a laughing emoji. I knew texting someone <laughs> twice couldn't be a mistake. I texted back and he responded a second later. We caught up on life after high school Jose told me he was a manager at a self-storage facility. I shared that I was working at Marshalls and taking classes at Mesa College. About an hour into chatting, it was clear to me Jose didn't contact me to ask about my general ed courses. <laughs> hey, he wrote, I was wondering if you'd want to go ice skating tomorrow. Again, with a laughing emoji. <laughs> OK, looking back, ending all his messages with a laughing emoji should have been a red flag. But I ignored this. He wanted to go ice skating with me. I was flattered, but terrified. You see, just like I wasn't the type to get asked out on dates, I also wasn't the type to strap two knives to my feet and run around on a block of ice. I would love to hang out, but ice skating isn't really my thing. Maybe we can go for a walk or go out to eat, I suggested. He responded, no. I want to go ice skating, and it has to be tomorrow. I explained I wasn't the most coordinated, and he reassured me he would take care of me and pick me up if I fell. I tried to meet him halfway, saying I could see you tomorrow, just not at an ice skating rink. When he suggested hiking, I agreed. I asked where we would be going so we could meet there, and he said he preferred to pick me up and drive to the trail. Something told me this was not a good idea. Even if he drove, I still need to know where we were going. The devil's punch bowl, he finally answered. Some quick research told me this was not only two hours away, but also people have fallen and died there. This guy was trying to get me killed. I could already imagine the, the, the news headline, local girl goes on first date of her life, falls off cliff, and dies. <laughs> I notified Jose of my research, thinking he'd be more understanding. <laughs> but instead, he said, Bianca, only one person has died there. Everyone else was just hospitalized. When I asked if we can go somewhere closer, possibly a place I wouldn't die, he acted like I was asking for a huge favor. 
<laughs> he told me to stop being so scared, you know, loosen up a little. Throughout this conversation, I still wondered why Jose was suddenly interested in me. Frustrated, I finally asked, why did it take you so long to ask me out? His response is he was too shy in high school to speak to me. But this didn't make any sense. I had seen Jose with other girls. It wasn't like he was someone who couldn't speak to the opposite sex. Something didn't add up. I tried to push for more of an explanation, but he ignored me and kept stating how cute and amazing I was. It was strange being admired by someone who didn't even know me. It seemed insincere, but also it was flattering. I'd never had a guy say these things before, so I stopped pushing for an explanation. Eventually we compromised and agreed to go to Seaport Village the following week. I finally relaxed and, re and began to revel in the fact that I was going on my first date. I was excited. For so long, I felt ashamed by my lack of romantic experience. And for once, I felt like I was normal. Sure, Jose seemed a little strange over text, but I thought once we saw each other in person, things would be different. In high school, he seemed like a nice, friendly guy. Hopefully he still was. But then, the same day we confirmed our, text, our date, Jose messaged me at 11 p.m. stating he wanted to push our date up and get coffee. Since, you know, what better time to drink coffee than at midnight? <laughs> I said it was too late. He pleaded with me and said all he needed was my address and he'd come over. I told him to just wait another couple of days and he wrote, Bianca, I like you a lot, but I could see you have walls up. But I will climb over those walls and get to you because I think you're amazing. Anyone else would have called this guy on his bullshit, but I went along because I was afraid if I didn't go out with Jose, I'd have to wait another 20 years for a guy to ask me out on a date again. So I texted him my address. Luckily for me, unfortunately for Jose, my mom's bedroom is right by her front door. As I opened the door, I heard her, I heard her get out of bed. Where are you going? She said. Jose is picking me up. We're going to get coffee. My mom looked at the clock. At midnight? I don't think he wants coffee. <laughs> but mom, if I don't go, he won't like me anymore. This could be my one chance at getting a boyfriend. Mm, this doesn't feel right. Tell him to go home and see you another day. By then, Jose was halfway to my house. As bad as I felt telling him to go home, I knew if my mom didn't trust his intentions, I shouldn't either. I texted Jose and though he whined, he respected my request and agreed to stick to our scheduled date. But on the morning of our scheduled date, Jose said we need to postpone because he was fixing his friend's computer. Around 10 p.m. that night, Jose, Jose said he was <laughs> finally ready to hang out. I told him it was too late. My resistance was met with a flood of text messages stating how much he missed me. How can you miss someone you don't even know? His interest was no longer flattering. It made my stomach churn. So I ignored his messages and went to sleep. I may have been eager for a boyfriend only a couple weeks before, but I couldn't ignore him. Something wasn't right. Why did Jose only want to see me at night? I understood he could just want sex, but he also only wanted to take me far from where we lived. That's why I did a little research, a deep dive into his Facebook. Quickly, <laughs> I noticed there was a girl who is in some of his pictures from the year before. His status showed they'd been in a relationship. I clicked on her profile and found an entire photo album of them together, posted only a week before. There were photos of them kissing and hugging, photos of them in matching Christmas pajamas, I even found a picture of him giving her a promise ring, which by the looks of it, came from a gumball machine. <laughs> it was clear to me they were still lovers, which only meant I was the other woman. Who would have guessed my first relationship would have been an affair? I was still a virgin, but I was also someone's side whore. Figuratively speaking, of course. I dug deeper and asked a friend from high school, Adriana, if she remembered Jose. She said Jose dated two of her friends at the same time without either of them knowing, and then had the nerve to ask Adriana out. Adriana also informed me of a fun fact. 
If a guy includes a laughing emoji in every text message, he's a fuckboy. <laughs> I was angry and disgusted, but mostly I was sad. I wasn't special to him. My first romantic experience was a dupe. Being asked out by a guy who would probably hump a plastic bag <laughs> made me feel worse than not getting asked out at all. This was not how I wanted to experience my first date. I decided the next time Jose texted me, I was going to confront him. I know the truth about you, I texted. Jose responded with a laughing emoji <laughs> and asked, what was I talking about? I know you have a girlfriend. I waited for his denial. Instead, he sent another laughing emoji. LOL, it's okay, Cherie knows about you. Wait, what? Then he wrote, Bianca, I'm Polly. Polly, like Polynesian? <laughs> this was confusing. Last time I checked, Jose was Mexican. <laughs> no, silly, polyamorous. I believe you should be able to love multiple people at the same time. I don't have anything against people in polyamorous relationships, but I was sure Jose was not poly. I'm pretty sure he didn't even know the correct definition. Aren't all parties informed when they're in a polyamorous relationship? Mm -hmm. If someone is dating two girls at the same time and one girl doesn't know about it, isn't that a cheating? <laughs> Listen, Jose, I don't know where you got your definition for polyamorous, but you are not poly. You're a lying, cheating jerk, and I want nothing to do with your fuck squad. Jose sent me a lengthy response in which he called me ignorant instead of, he'd only known I would insult the polyamorous culture. <laughs> he would have never bothered to speak to me, nor try to start a relationship. He concluded with, have a nice life, which is code for, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Though I still felt sad, I was proud of myself. I had enough self-respect to know I deserved a good first date with a guy who respected me. It sucked, but I concluded I just have to wait a bit longer to experience a first date. And a couple months later, I was asked out by a guy who was honest, made me feel comfortable, and didn't use laughing emojis. <laughs> he made sure our first date was nearby during the daytime. We went on a hike at Sunset Cliffs, had pizza, and spent hours talking in his car. Six years later, we're still together. So in the end, my mom was right. <laughs> Good things do come to those who wait. My dad, like many dads in the 90s, wanted to be Harrison Ford. <laughs> he probably still wants to, but it was obvious in that decade. Even to his three sons who didn't understand the idea of molding one's personal style to peak Hollywood cool. My brothers and I watched tons of Harrison Ford movies alongside our dad, who cared little for the phrase, some material inappropriate for children under 13. <laughs> At ages as young as 9 or 10, we watched a Nazi's face melt off in Raiders of the Lost Ark, a woman brutally murdered in The Fugitive, and a convoy of Suburbans get RPG'd in clear and present danger. Let me focus on that last one for a sec. Specifically, my dad wanted to be Jack Ryan from Clear and Present Danger, the ultimate dad movie. As a devout Catholic, the film's tagline, Truth Needs a Soldier, spoke directly to his sense of righteous morality. And as a Republican taxpayer during the Clinton administration, the plot, featuring a man who defied the federal government at every turn, spoke to him even more. My dad first incorporated Jack Ryan into his identity by appropriating the guy's look, his iconic aviator shades. They took up 50% of his face, and the half that was still visible suggested that he could not and should not ever pilot an aircraft. <laughs> My dad, who started going bald in his late 20s, didn't have Jack Ryan's bountiful brown hair, nor did he stand over six feet, and nor did he have a cushy government job that let him rub shoulders with the president's chief of staff. But he could at least have those sunglasses. I think they helped him feel like Jack Ryan a hero of post-Cold War Tom Clancy novels, a CIA analyst who always found himself in the crosshairs of an international incident, 
Back when this character was first popular, suburban households breathlessly watched Tom Brokaw report on tactical smart bomb hits during Desert Storm. Jack Ryan was the 90s version of Jack Bauer, except with, you know, less torturing and fewer Arabs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was first played by Alec Baldwin, but come on, what red-blooded American father wants to be Alec Baldwin instead of Harrison Ford? <laughs> The first time Harrison Ford played Jack Ryan was in Patriot Games. If you haven't seen it, it's on Amazon Prime, and you should rectify that immediately. It's 90s cinema to an extreme degree. The bad guys use Israeli-made Uzi submachine guns. In one scene, Ryan tells an intel geek to magically enhance the images from a spy satellite years before CSI made that shit famous. <laughs> There's even a scene where a terrorist moodily watches Enya music videos as a rainstorm batters his house. In this movie, Jack Ryan is a former CIA spook who teaches midshipmen at the U.S. Naval Academy. He served his country in the Marine Corps and now lives with his hot wife in a remarkable seaside estate in the Chesapeake Bay. The action kicks off when on a trip to London with his wife and daughter, Ryan foils an assassination attempt on a member of the royal family. After shielding his wife and daughter from a car bomb with his own body, he tackles and disarms one terrorist, kills two more, and takes a bullet to the shoulder. It's riveting stuff. <laughs> it's exactly the kind of heroic opportunity I think my dad always looked for. As a father of three boys, it made sense that he'd be on the prowl for chances to exhibit not only competent masculinity, but uncommon valor as well. Using a miter saw to build a backyard tree fort is one thing. Stopping a rogue faction of the Irish Republican Army is something else entirely. <laughs> Can you blame him for fantasizing about this? I mean, this is the kind of right place at the right time courage most men dream of. If my dad was anything like I am now, he always wondered how he'd perform in a high threat scenario. Maybe he still does. I know I do. The only problem is my dad never taught me how to stop a terrorist attack. <laughs> Maybe that's why he so frequently popped in the VHS cassette of Patriot Games on Family Movie Night, hoping I'd learn by watching Harrison do his thing. The most my dad did, and his most was enough, was teach me how to be a good man. And on a near daily basis, I questioned my strength at this by wondering if I had the courage to intervene and stop someone from getting hurt. Because I traffic in low profile bravery, a kind of baseline competence I delude myself into thinking is a form of heroism. I've helped change a few flat tires in my day. I've lost track of how many couches I've helped my friends move. I have even, and I'm being very literal here, walked an old lady across the street. <laughs> but the closest I've gotten to being a man of action was the time I got into a shutting match with a homeless person who provoked me in a liquor store. Not my finest moment. Homeless people aren't terrorists, and whatever threats they pose don't exactly call for Jack Ryan-style intervention. I can't be the only man who sees threats where none exist. I know I'm not, because my dad still does it. Surely if the IRA came to Poway to assassinate the mayor on a family trip to Baskin Robbins, my dad, even at age 66, would be the first to act. After all, he was in the city's chamber of commerce. I remember him scanning his environment through those oversized aviators, seeking threats, trying to notice if anything was off. To this day, he habitually locks his doors when he's stopped at an intersection with panhandlers in the median. And while walking with my mother on the sidewalk, he still positions himself on whatever side of the road, whatever side the road is on, presumably to block careening vehicles with his own body. Here's the thing, I do all of this and more. My girlfriend can't stand it when we're about to cross the street and I instinctively put my arm out to shield her from an oncoming car. She has her own brain, her own eyeballs, but whenever I perceive a threat, I ignore her basic capacity for keeping herself alive and become my overprotective father. But even though my dad never once pushed someone out of the way of a drunk driver, tackled a terrorist, or even exercised his constitutional right to buy a gun, my brothers and I already saw our dad as Jack Ryan. The aviators helped cement the image in our minds, but he was truly the closest we had to our own personal Harrison Ford and the stand-up guys he always played. President James Marshall, Dr. Richard Kimball, Han Solo. We loved those characters as much as he did, and he was our closest conduit to actually knowing the man who played them, even if he never achieved any of their movie star heroics. 
He was the protagonist of his own story, wherever there was one to tell. He intricately landscaped and irrigated our front yard. He taught me to drive, even while instilling the fear of both God and high-speed collisions. <laughs> and he saved the day, every single day, by ensuring there was enough money in my college meal plan account. Those were his heroics, not Harrison Ford's. And the thing about Harrison Ford and the gargantuan characters he often played is, you never got the sense that they were the kind of men to seriously confide in. I doubt Han Solo and Chewbacca had very many heart-to-hearts. These are men who just do. Don't get me wrong, my dad always had an open-door policy. Far more inviting office hours than Professor of Archaeology Dr. Henry Jones Jr. I benefited from several truthful and valuable discussions with him, formative talks upon which I still rely today. But when it came to the truly personal stuff, I must admit to preferring my mother. She was the better choice for talking about the crushes I had on the girls at school. Dad was more suited for discussing my ancient Egypt social studies homework. <laughs> the reason why is, just like Jack Ryan, my dad could be intimidating. Ryan had a smoldering intensity, and he pointed his finger a lot without breaking eye contact with whomever he was staring down. <laughs> he was always grabbing by his guys by the collar and growling at them with righteous fury. I think my dad took some of his parenting lessons from this kind of physicality. Sometimes he'd poke his finger directly into my sternum when I fucked up, or grasp me by the neck and rotate my head toward the altar when I didn't pay attention in church. I hated disappointing him as a kid because he was the only person in my life I wanted to impress. Then something changed. The illusion broke. Harrison Ford became old, and so did my dad. He suddenly became separated from the Jack Ryan image, probably because Harrison Ford started making bad movies. By the time he was attempting awful Russian accents, slumming it in buddy cop flicks, and crashing his airplane every fucking month, <laughs> his capable dad energy faded into history. All this happened to coincide with the end of my adolescence and the beginning of my adult years. At first, the older dad got, the wiser he got. As my brothers and I moved into our first jobs, wrote college application letters, and selected our majors, we eagerly sought out his advice. He had the experience and the information, and we were in the market for it. Then my brothers and I officially became adults who knew things, and selected a number of areas where we thought better than our father. That list continues to expand, including, but not limited to, investment opportunities, relationship strategies, and the number of children to sire. Today, I still want my dad's approval, but to a lesser degree. Many of us get to this point where we stop seeing our parents as people to impress and start seeing them as people like us, people with flaws, people who aren't movie stars. I should admit, however, I, o I remain open to the possibility of impressing Harrison Ford. If Harrison Ford ever said how disappointed he was in me, I would sob uncontrollably. <laughs> My father doesn't wear aviators anymore, and he refers to the latest actor to play Jack Ryan as that one guy. <laughs> He's dedicated his 50s and 60s to God while proudly serving as a deacon at the Catholic Church. He moves a bit slower these days, but I have no doubt if a suicide bomber decided to interrupt his Sunday mass, dad would leap clear over four church pews, tackle the motherfucker to the ground, and save every person in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Did you all enjoy the show? I just want to thank everyone for being here and everyone watching. We want to thank our coaches and mentors. And once again, I want to thank our performers, Leslie Ferguson, Woo! Kelly Bowen, ben, ben Kent, Woo! Elaine Gingery, Woo! Bianca Sanchez, Woo! and Brent Hannity. Thank you all. Good night, and we'll see you next time.